Okay, we are gonna go get started here. Thank you all for coming out. Um, my name is Alexander Rose, I'm the executive director here at Long Now, and um, we're uh, coming up on, or coming through halfway through our uh, 2016 season here at the Interval. Um, and as many of you know from tonight, all these talks do sell out, so that the best way always to uh, make sure that you get advance notice about these tickets is by being a member. How many people are members here? Wow, see, that's how you get tickets. <laughs> uh, as well as our patrons, so thank you very much for uh, getting the patron tickets, those really help this series uh, work out. And we are now recording the series, um, and thanks to uh, our sponsor, Ed Bertinsky, uh, the photographer who's working on his movie, Anthropocene. Um, he's also sponsoring our live cast, so thank you very much. I'm going to have Stuart uh, give an introduction to Stan. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Stuart Brand from the Long Now Foundation. Do I have sound? Can you hear okay? Great, we're good. Um, Next 10,000 years, last 10,000 years, uh, for a lot of people, it's kind of a, you know, you grind your way into that. For science fiction writers, they are right at home with that kind of thinking. And particularly science fiction writers like the one with us tonight who have gone that far and further into the future and that far and further into the past and held them all in their mind. I first got onto Kim Stanley Robinson with the, with the Mars series and Red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars is um, an amazing piece of work. He has been doing book after book, trilogy after trilogy. And the next thing that's interesting about science fiction writers is when they do a lifetime of that kind of writing and thinking, then you get some extra perspective that is watching itself think long term and watching its own mind change over the decades of thinking that kind of long term. So we have a 64 year old science fiction writer here tonight and I can't wait to hear what he has to say, Kim Stanley Robinson. <laughs> Well, thank you, Stuart, and thank you, everybody, for helping me and having me here. Um, I, uh, we lost the title of the talk, but it's something like uh, climate change will uh, force post-capitalism or something like that, and that's the uh, train of thought that I want to pursue here, and um, it will ho hopefully orient me. The, the way I want to start is to uh, put the crisis in a kind of quantitative terms that we can burn about 500 gigatons more carbon into the atmosphere um, bef before we've hit the 1.5 C average global temperature rise, beyond which things get stranger and more dangerous, according to the uh, scientists making the guesses. And that, at the current speed of burn, will happen at about the year 2040. So the quicker we slow down, the longer we have before we hit that kind of a moment. But what has to be added to that is that we have already discovered 2,500 gigatons of uh, fossil carbon in the ground in the form of coal, oil, and natural gas. And those 2,500 gigatons of carbon are already on the books of corporations as assets and already claimed by nation states as national resources. So um, I once did a literally back of the envelope type calculation uh, to, on current prices of carbon, and this is in a very artificial exercise. For one thing, the current price of carbon has changed since I made the calculation, and I got either $160 trillion or $1,600 trillion, but you know, what's a decimal point among friends? Um, it was a lot of money, and there are going to be people of goodwill who, in positions of power, as a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders or as a, a political duty to their citizens, are going to be wanting to burn some portion of those trillions of dollars, of those gigatons, thinking that they'll slip a, a trillion or so into their coffers uh, before the clamp comes down and the the whatever is left, the 2,000 gigatons that needs to be left in the ground so that we still have the same planet we're on now, will be some kind of uh, stranded assets. 
And stranded assets on companies' books create um, what you might call zombie companies. This is, we call them zombie banks in Japan. If you have uh, supposed assets that are actually debts or are stranded assets, and you can't tell how much they are, and you don't discharge them from the books, then you have a zombie bank. And this is going to happen to some of the biggest companies on Earth in a system uh, that is um, neoliberal capitalism, late capitalism, postmodern capitalism. It's a world order, a combination of nation state laws and international treaties that, that um, governs the entire world. And as we spoke of algorithms earlier in the introduction. There's a very simple algorithm, algorithm at the base of all this, kind of like a, uh, a prime directive or a first axiom, in, like in Euclid, that everything else comes out of. And this is out of neoclassical economics, which is simply to assume that for human beings, more is better. So when you start with this uh, prime uh, directive that more is better, which is from Pareto and, from, and to a certain extent from Adam Smith, it simplifies, and in the economic textbooks, they will simply say this removes uh, other value considerations from economic uh, calculations, which is, of course, disregarding that more is better is a value in itself. But in any case, <laughs> more is better equates to two measurements um, in the algorithm that would be uh, quarterly profit and shareholder value. And when these are the main criteria for whether we're doing well or ill on this planet, you immediately get to some um, very serious problems. And sticking to carbon for just a second here, I'll say that um, it was the president of the World Bank, who therefore is one of the high priests of global capitalism, who said, we need to put a price on carbon. And this was a astonishing admission for someone who is a spokesperson for free market capitalism and neoliberalism to say, essentially, the pricing system has failed when it comes to putting a price on carbon, and it's not, the price we put on it is too low. It, it, the true cost of it is higher than the price, and it's an admission of market failure from right in the heart of the market system itself. Now, what's interesting about this notion of underpricing is it's not just carbon. All commodities and all labor are underpriced. And this is because of the way our system works. There's a downward pressure on pricing because it's a cumulative equilibrium. It's crowdsourced. It's democratic. It, it is a, a, indeed a cumulative equilibrium of all the buyers and sellers coming together, agreeing in a free contractual manner that I'll pay you this much for thus and such, and I'll sell it to you for that much. Unfortunately, all the buyers w are stressed and want to buy things for as little as they can get them, so they buy it for as cheap, cheap as possible. All the sellers want to stay in business and are in competition with the other sellers, and so there is, on both sides, in a collusion of everybody alive today to make prices shift downward to the point where things cost Things are priced for less than it costs to make them. And I get confused with that because it sounds like a description of bankruptcy, and indeed, <laughs> many companies do go bankrupt. But um, what happens is the true cost, which was higher than the price that got charged and paid, um, is shoveled under the carpet and into the future. Externalities for the biosphere and um, labor costs that are below a living wage for labor. So what happens is that two, two parts of the world get hammered by this drive downward of prices. Um, the, the, um, the selling things for less than they cost to make means that there's what, this is a technical term in economics called dumping or even predatory dumping, where you sell things for less than they cost to make it, hope to drive your competitors out of business, and then you raise the price to the level where you make a bigger profit. But in this case, the competitors are future generations who are very poor at competition at this point. <laughs> so what it, this is also so, the definition of what, how a Ponzi scheme works. And it could be that now, if you think of our economy as a multi-generational Ponzi scheme, that now is the, the Bernie Madoff moment is now. We're hitting it. And the, that's why we see the environmental and human problems that we see. Um, there's a wonderful, uh, now one of the ways that economics manages to uh, excuse itself for this 
um, predatory dumping on the future is the assumption that's made in, in classical economics that the future is going to be richer than the present. And that also if you rate our interests against all of the future generations, which extend out maybe to, well, the long now, 10,000 years, then we are, uh, 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 don't rate very highly rated to everybody else. So it gets um, amortized. The future gets discounted. So if you discount the future uh, at a 1% at a rate, then you're saying that the future is going to need our help and we therefore are going to save money and we're going to uh, treat the future as if it's important and needs our help. But if you think the future, because of our great technical advancements, they're going to be richer than us, you discount the future more heavily, like at a 5% rate, saying, look, they'll take care of themselves. And so, so a, a small uh, uh, discounting rate um, values the future, a high discount rate disvalues the future, and there's always a very high discounting of the future in our economy. Um, and it has to be said that this is a political and ethical decision. It's not a scientific, technical, or economic decision, except in as much as economic decisions are political and ethical decisions at all point. So the future pays for what we've done, and the assumption that is made in economics is they'll be able to pay their way out of it later has to do with fungibility, the idea that everything is fungible to anything else, and especially to money itself, that essentially if things go bad, they will just pay money to buy their way out of it. But unfortunately, there are many things that are not fungible to money, um, health, extinction. Um, there are things that you can't buy your way out of. Uh, ocean acidification, you, we can't buy our way out of. And this is just one of many things. So the other problem with the capitalist system that we're living in, we have now given the name uh, inequality. And that's a good name. I'm, at times in the past, they've called it class, or at times in, uh, it's had different names. But inequality, calling it now, it's not a bad name for the, what we're talking about. 1% of the people on the planet own 42% of the human wealth. And the top 5% of income earners on this planet, of capital holders, own about 85% of the human wealth. So it is a kind of an oligarchy. It's as extreme as it's been since the Gilded Age or since feudal times. People have different ways of rating this, but it is very, very high, and people are noticing it. And inequality, which is a natural result of the capitalist system, it's not uh, people gaming the system or cheating the system. It is the natural result of things working the way they work. You get uh, a, a human population where only 1% or 5% or maybe 20% of the population is comfortable. Everybody else, the joke is to call it the precariat, you know, <laughs> from the proletariat to the precariat. Everybody's situation is precarious. There's been um, a financialization of risk, financialization of daily life. Risk has been shifted off onto people. And now, again, this is an economic term. Risk sort of implies, like you're in a casino, that you get to choose. If you say, well, I don't like risk, I'm going to avoid risk, and so I'm, I choose not to take risks. But the risks are of, of aging, of getting sick, of not having a pension. In other words, these are not so much risks as inevitability and the cost of them have been privatized rather than socialized in the last 30 years. It's also true that the richest and the poorest people on the planet have the worst impacts on the environment. The richest people by way of overconsumption. I mean, we all consume 30 times the resources of your ordinary peasant in the Indian backcountry, and, um, and we are not most of us in the 1%. And so consumption goes up from there, and then the idea of how many people there are on the planet is not anywhere near the same as thinking how many consumption units are there on the planet, which varies according to affluence. And then the poorest by way of um, deforestation and topsoil loss. Essentially, if you need to feed your family that night and you need firewood to do it, you go out into the forest, you cut them down, you're not worrying about uh, anything else but getting food on the table that night for hungry people, and then with the forest cut down, the topsoil runs away, and you get a vicious circle of uh, environmental impact. So the upshot is that the system that we're living in is destroying both people and the biosphere, and it's not an accident. Well, no, it is an accident, but it's not a, a distortion of the system as such. It's the straightforward working of the system as such, as designed. So we're in a bad algorithm, and yet it is the law of the world. So at this point, I think um, you know, it's justifiable to be, justifiable to be 
uh, concerned, maybe terrified is the right word, um, you know, if we have to save the environment of the world from climate change, and then you add on to that, well, you can't do it unless you save uh, and reform capitalism itself, the law of the world, it's like doubling down, and it would be better if you could just solve the environment first and then solve our human problems, but the problem is the human problem is the environmental problem. The two of them are connected, the two of them are intimately related, and in fact, the one follows from the other. So, um, well, I have left myself half the time here to save the world, so I will proceed. <laughs> but I'll have to go fast. How do we fix this, uh, given where we are? And um, it's best to use Paul Ehrlich's IPAT formula to articulate how we're going to save the world. Our impact on the environment is a, not just a matter of human population, but of population times appetite or affluence times technology. This is the famous IPAT formula, and it's very useful for articulating this matter that a human being is not, n not all human beings have the same impact on the environment. So let's take it one at a time. You say uh, population. We do need to stabilize population, and this is something that often doesn't get allowed to be talked about by the environmental movement, because it sounds like then you're more interested in the environment than you are in people, although the two are so much the same. But you can say that and have immediately the solution, because population stabilizes when women have their full set of legal rights. And this has just been proved demographically. Thank you. Across the whole world, we have had sample cases in Thailand, in Indonesia, and in the prosperous half of Mexico. When laws have changed that give women their full set of legal rights and education, etc., the population replacement rate drops below 2.2%, which is the replacement, 2.2 uh, kids per, per woman. It drops below that, down into a sustainable and even a decrease in population. This is something we can count on, and it means that there's a double good. You know, women's rights equal uh, population stabilization equals environmental stabilization. It's a great uh, doubling. It's not a doubling to complain about or, or like, oh my gosh, we want this to be a pure moral good without use value. Use value and moral value together, that's not a bad thing to have. It just empowers them both. Then secondly, technology. I mean, here we are in the whole earth catalog. Clean tech. We are getting closer and better at clean tech. We've been in a, a sort of Stalinist, uh, Chelyabinsk 65 of a world, way dirtier than you think because so much of it is invisible and off-sided. And yet, um, we can see now because of the carbon burn especially, but in many other ways, pollution um, and, and strange chemicals, pesticides included, that we've been putting out into the world faster than the world can chew them up and, and restore them to more natural chemicals. And that's been going on for a long time, but the cleaner techs are already here and getting better fast. So what we would need is to find a way to pay ourselves to install them as fast as possible, to swap out from a dirty fossil fuel tech to a clean renewable tech of any kind that would be consistently improving. And this comes back then again, unfortunately, to the middle term which Ehrlich called affluence, and I don't like that um, because Thoreau was affluent and he lived on nothing. So affluence is like a, it's the wrong word. I called it appetite and I think some other people called it appetite so you could keep the A. I think we could just call it economics now and, and, and call it the I-pet formula uh, w because what we really mean here is the economic system is also a value system of how much do we use and how do we pay ourselves for what we do. And so that is where you get to this question of how can we afford survival itself? Um, can we afford to survive? It, it, because it doesn't pencil out. The, the, very commonly with standard economics, you will say to someone, well, it would be way better if we had solar power and, and clean energy within 10 years. And they say, well, but, but it's so much more expensive. Or you could say, you know, the Ogdalala aquifer is being sucked up and used, that's fossil water. When it goes, a huge swath of the central United States is going to be without fresh water. And so you could say, well, we should immediately be making gigantic uh, clean energy desalination plants all around the Gulf of Mexico or whatnot. People, and then the answer is, well, but that's too expensive. And again, there's that fungibility. There's that discounting of the future. In the future, when, it, when water that isn't there becomes quite expensive, even though non-existent, then it will actually uh, pencil out to have desalination. So doing it now and ahead of time 
that's why uh, Frank Ackerman's book is called uh, Can We Afford the Future? And that's also why my uh, old advisor, Frederick Jameson, I think is the one who made up this saying that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. And this has become one of the truisms of our time, one of the slogans of the postmodern era. And I'm thinking, I want to do what Fred would do, is analyze this phrase a little bit more and, and actually look at the form of the content of this phrase rather than the phrase itself. If you think of the end of the world as a bad thing, then okay. It's easier to imagine the bad thing. And then the end of capitalism, if you agree with my analysis of it, then that would, the end of, an, of capitalism would be a good thing. So what the phrase is really saying is that it's easier to imagine bad things than it is to imagine good things. Granted, okay, that's probably true. Um, it's a matter of saying that it's easier to feel your fears than it is to feel your hopes. And uh, in many ways, especially in certain hours of the night, the fears are stronger than hopes. And so we are pray, pray to them. And the idea of imagining a better future is um, maybe admirable or, or desirable. And yet, uh, with, given the situation that we're in, imagining the end of the world is, is easier than imagining the end of capitalism. Imagining the bad is easier than imagining the good. But hope is tough. And it continues to persist in all situations. So we were going to hope our way forward here as I continue to attempt to find the uh, lever that um, um, to, to um, the Archimedes lever to change the situation. We got finance, which is really free-floating capital, a system, the market, the laws that um, allow capital to move around the world with immense liquidity and power that can, if it wants, the market can destroy any individual's um, uh, currency by going in and speculating on in a certain way, as Soros did with England, as Europe is now doing with Greece. So there's free floating capital. There's also governments, nation states. And there's also simply people. And I'm thinking that they're in a kind of a scissors, rock, paper configuration, where it isn't immediately obvious which one manages to hammer the others, but there's a very strong case being made today. Uh, Lazzarato's Governing by Debt is a very eye-opening book. Maurizio Lazzarato, that finance has whipped governments. That because governments all have huge pu public debt, those debts, those government debts, are to the banks, to finance, which meanwhile has the freedom to move anywhere it wants around the world, and there are no liquidity controls on currencies. So it, there are people who are saying that really it's game over, that, that finance always ran governments, that governments were always a false front, and democracy was always a kind of a kabuki for people to feel comforted by. This is a little too cynical, I think. There's a better history that can be written of the power of democratic governments that come out of the 18th century with quite a bit of, of uh, energy. And I feel that after the enclosure of the commons, people were so immiserated that democratic governments were the virtual commons. So the first virtuality is democratic government in the 18th century. But it's a, it's anytime there's a commons, virtual or real, there's enclosure. And enclosure can always succeed by the immense universal solvent power of money and its universal fungibility on people's brains. But finance, in its current configuration, prides itself on being efficient. And efficiency in economic terms is a funny word. It has to do with you know, just-in-time manufacturing, of, of not wasting at any point along the way. And I will say this, efficiency is uh, probably non-human, but a, a kind of an algorithm. But definitely, it's not resilient or robust. Efficiency is fragile. So in this case, uh, finance is never content to have uh, only its own money in the bank. It loans it out. It leverages it. So all of the big five banks and in the United States and all big investment institutions and firms are leveraged out to, um, to the point where only 3 to 4% of the loans that they have given out to the world do they have in assets in hand back there at the bank itself. This was revised by um, Dodd-Frank and by the Oxley Sarbans after the 2008 crash. And the, the Congress managed to regulate to the point where they upped it up to like 5%, but then finance and the big banks have wedged it back down. There's a, something that Congress has mandated called the um, 
systemically important financial institution, the SIFI, which is really means too big to fail, with the idea that you don't want to have institutions that are too big to fail because then we have to bail them out. Well, both Westinghouse and General Electric have gone to the courts and argued that they are not too big to fail, that they're small enough that they can fail and no one will be harmed because they don't want to be put under the regulations and restrictions that are put on the big SIFI, and they both won their cases. I wish I could see the transcript of their lawyers uh, saying to the government, no, we're not important, we're just, we're, we're really a tiny company. But in any case, they are over leveraged. They're hanging out there over the abyss and what they do is rely on people People are illiquid in that you need a job, you need a house, you need a pension. Those are uh, uh, investments that last for years. You can't pull them and reinvest them somewhere else at a higher rate of return instantaneously or millions of times a second, like finance can do with their liquidity. So there are ways in which it looks like uh, finance has the upper hand and is like the rock smashing the scissors or the scissors cutting the paper because liquidity always beats illiquidity and big always beats small in these battles under the laws as we've set them up. But finance relies on bundled payments of mortgages, student debt, utility payments, and indeed debts of all kinds from responsible citizens that come in on a monthly basis to the big banks, to the, to the loan holders, who then take it, bundle it, loan it back out, leverage it, and they, they are in essence overextended. So a moment comes when uh, I can see some of you are seeing my point here, the ultimate source of value, the ultimate securitization of all of these loans are people themselves and the payments that they've contracted to make. So there's a concept going around now that's sometimes called fiscal noncompliance or strategic defaulting or simply strike or odious debt personal odious debt, or the jubilee, or even the idea that if everybody went to the bank on the same day and asked for their deposit back out, the banks would not be able to do it and they would crash on the spot. In other words, being as over leveraged as they are, the crash of 2008 could be artificially repeated by people doing it on purpose. So the subprime mortgage crisis, and hopefully you've all seen the big short, you know the story, I can skip that. Um, it was caused by people promising to pay debts that they didn't have the money to pay, and so when time went on, they all crashed at the same time, and the whole system came down. That, that can happen again any time. The, uh, the way capitalism works is permanent growth. There'll be another bubble. There'll be another crash. But in this case, people could actually cause the crash on purpose. July 4th, 2019. You pick your date. You have Independence Day, whatever. You know, not paying your mortgage is possibly going to be a popular move. There would be this particular kind of surveillance. Everybody is all freaked out about surveillance. The government is watching you at all times. It's big brotherish, blah, blah, blah. Everybody complains on this on Facebook and on their Twitter. So um, it's a little bit bizarre. But say it's a real complaint. But here's the surveillance that counts. Your credit rating. That's surveillance by finance of you. So if we were to have this moment of strategic um, defaulting fiscal non-compliance to bring the banks down, A, afterwards we would have to figure, forgive ourselves by way of Congress this odious debt and everybody's um, credit rating would have to reflect that their, their credit rating for that particular day was a, a matter of free speech and um, political action and therefore forgivable. And, or on the other hand, um, you could just say that after that happens, you get retroactive debt restructuring. And we go back to the table and renegotiate with the banks what's going on. But, the, but OK, we bring down the banks. This is like bringing down the, your mountaineering partner on the big face. You don't, you know, you're tied to them. You don't really want to bring them down because then you, oh my god, I'm tied to them. We're both going down. This is what was happening in 2008. So there needs to be another part of the plan in place, which simply is a government that understands that at that point, the basket for saving the finance climber that you have suddenly clipped their belay and they're falling, the, the basket is this, you nationalize them. We nationalized GM in 2008, it worked, they paid us back, we saved their ass, the real economy needed saving, finance we paid off, we bailed out at 100 cents on the dollar 
to the tune of somewhere between $7 trillion and $13 trillion. I've heard both figures. Friday at UCI, I heard $13 trillion by a very distinguished economic historian. This is because of quantitative easing as well as the original bailout. So um, that amount of money um, is a, a kind of amazing act. But this time, if we've crashed the bank or if they happen to blow a bubble on their own, either way, we have to at that point say, yes, we'll bail you out, but now we own you. And so now we own you means the government is the board of directors, that we begin to set regulations, we begin to determine loans. It would be like the Federal Credit Union. All of these things have their precedence in earlier public utility district type moves. So at that point, with the government taking over, it would run the loan strategies, the repayment rates, and to the extent that it profited, the profits would just go into the treasury. You combine that with the obvious carbon tax that we need to put on, which is not a tax, but is paying the true cost. We need to reconceptualize. And then also the Thomas Piketty tax, which would be um, what he suggested two years ago, which is that you don't just have a progressive tax on um, income, because people who are wealthy enough can hide their income in another country or under the rug or in future what, um, investments in the future. So income you can hide. Capital assets, a progressive tax, sharply progressive tax on capital assets is such a game changer, such a paradigm buster, that when the Wall Street Journal and The Economist reviewed Piketty's book and they got to this last chapter, they said, oh, well, but that would never work because, and then their 500-word article ran out and they got to stop at that point. They never said why, because there is no why, because it would work. And it would be an incredibly powerful tool in terms of the horizontalization of human wealth to more of the population. There's hardly a better suggestion. And Piketty's book may have been, as some people said, you know, 11 chapters of Marxism followed by one chapter of Keynesian reform suggestions. But I'm, you know, I'm a Keynesian myself. I think we're in a Keynesian world. And I think many people who do the 11 chapters of Marxian analysis would then like to contribute something useful that could be done right now in the world. And a tax structure is not the most radical uh, suggestion. It's already been done before. So that would create a government surplus. Instead of government being in debt to finance forever, in eternity, and therefore under the thumb of finance, government would be having a surplus, would be in control of finance, and it would have flipped the scissors rock paper as to who controls who. At that point, paper would control gov people would control governments, governments would control finance, finance would work for the people, you would have the, the way that the system needed to work. Now, what would we do with that money? Healthcare, of course. Um, free public education, of course. Through college, why not? And then also, full employment, because full employment is another gigantic paradigm buster for capitalism. We have 5.4% minimum unemployment. If it goes below that, the market's depressed, and you, you want labor wage pressure. Wage pressure is pressure on human beings' lives and minds in order to keep them willing to work for depressed wages so that profits will be better. Once again, it's going back to that one algorithm. So what you would want at that point with full employment, if you could always get a good living wage job from the government, then uh, private industries that existed, uh, which would be on the margin, I would call it, would have to compete by giving a living wage themselves, and everybody would have one along with Social Security. So what would everybody do? Well. There, there's no, this idea that automation is going to get rid of jobs is a very silly, bad science fiction story. It's not right. It's not going to be that way. Many things take the human touch. Um, taking care of young people, taking care of old people, taking care of sick people, and also landscape restoration. Um, that's the environmental work uh, of, of this project, of, of a, a government that's in control of, of the, the human slash biosphere future, because the two are tied together would be an enormous amount of infrastructure changes and uh, landscape restoration in general to get us a planet where we're not using up you know, the biosphere's regenerative possibilities by August of every year, which is what we're doing now, but are in balance with the biosphere properly. So at that point, that's my definition of post-capitalism, and I don't want to put any other name on it than that. And in fact, if you'd like to say, but it's still capitalism, there will still be capital, there'll still be a kind of a regulated market, that's fine by me. It's not about names, it's about function and survivability, about robustness and resilience in facing the climate change that is already baked in. So it doesn't matter. And at first axiom, if more is better is the wrong one, what's the right one? 
probably something like Aldo Leopold, what's good is what's good for the land. You unpack that, you find the derivatives of that one. If it's good for the land, it's gonna be good for people eventually. Another one might be the greatest good for the greatest number if this is Bentham and you know, uh, John Stuart Mill, the idea would be that um, the greatest number includes the biosphere itself, all the living creatures, the bacteria, the plants, the animals, especially the other mammals that are so endangered. Uh, the, the greatest good for the greatest number is a good rubric, and so is what's good is what's good for the land. More is better is not a good rubric, and we're gonna have to change it, but in detail and in general as a kind of a value system. So at that point, capitalism as we know it now will be a residual in the system, in the residual emergent idea of Raymond Williams. And as residual, you could apply it to the toys and the games and to tourism. Uh, if the necessities are socialized, like uh, food, water, shelter, clothing, healthcare, education, all those socialized and belonging to all of this as public utilities, then you could still say, I want an iPhone 12 more than an iPhone 11, and there could still be companies making a profit it might cost you, realistically, you know, $25,000 for your iPhone rather than 1000 if you want to pay the true cost of it, but some people might want to do that, and some people might afford it enough to be able to do it. They, you would certainly take better care of your phone, your car, your goods in general. So this is the, this is the notion of capitalism on the margin, regulated market, and then this is, I want to end with the greatest American science fiction short story. Uh, you will recognize it that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from this earth. It's the shall not. That's a future imperative. It makes it a science fiction story. It's not a given. We are not, it's not a legacy thing. It's a perpetual battlefield. Government of, by, and for the people right now is endangered, as you know. It's, it's heavily under threat. Because finance, thinking everything's fungible to everything else, is thinking, well, we can buy the governments too. So uh, the struggle over government is going on, and this injunction by this command by Lincoln at, the, at Gettysburg itself is a very important reminder. It's a, science, it's a utopian science fiction story, in effect, because democracy is not natural, nor is it easy. It's more complicated than anything else. So this is, this is the science fiction story to end with, and I just hit 35 minutes on the noggin. <laughs> wow. 3504. Have a seat. I'll grab these things. I've got a couple questions. I expect you've got some questions, so let me do my two quickly and then we'll get to real discussion. Go, 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 go. Hang on to that drink if you want. It. Yeah. No, I need alcohol now. Um, <laughs> give me a little more on the subtitle, how climate will evolve government society. So the climate, you see, is in this century a forcing mechanism, I guess, for what you're talking about. Right. How does that play out because of climate? Carbon tax, I got. What else? Well, um, uh, sea level rise. Once we get past the tipping point, of a, a, a certain tipping points, mm -hmm. then th we can't do anything about it. They will be unstoppable, we'll be in coping mode. So, um, and it's, it's exactly the capitalist system that has got us teetering around the brink through its own successes. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, again, it's accidental, it's successful, it is not villainous or criminal, and it's not being cheated on or tweaked. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm thinking that when people realize that the biosphere itself is in danger and that we're in danger of creating the sixth great mass extinction event, mm -hmm. so we got the Anthropocene, we've got the five great mass extinction events, and now we're starting the sixth one, mm -hmm. that this will force the action on what might have taken centuries otherwise. So we've had climate change going on for a while. Do you see signs of this kind of forcing happening? Yes, heck yes. We, we, uh, right now we have a democratic socialist running for president. This is not just immiseration and the 1%. Um, I, I, I sort of assumed you were not supporting Donald Trump in this. Donald this Trump, well, this is, a, this is again a forcing action. I mean, it, the, the reactions to this kind of stress will be intense and crazy across the board. And, you know, that I, I want to also add very quickly that if women's rights are a world issue for the environment and for justice, mm -hmm. that we also have a candidate running this election that has done more for women's rights institutionally than almost any other human in the history of the human race, which is Hillary Clinton. So, 
Um, I personally would love to see them just fuse. Like, you guys here can probably do this, right? You just kind of um, make them into one candidate. But um, I, I, would, I would want to, I want to add that about Hillary because I can see that she's going to be facing a tremendous amount of unwarranted criticisms. Here, here. Um, I suppose another politically related question is, um, you just got the Robert Heinlein Award, right? Yes. <laughs> I sense a little irony there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Robert Heinlein probably twisted more adolescent minds into libertarian uh, approach to life than anybody uh, writing. Well, now, um, yeah, <laughs> that's true, but I'm trying to cut him some slack, and there's, re there's good ways to do it. When he was young and living in Los Angeles, he was known as Crazy Bob Heinlein. And he believed in line marriages, uh, nudity, utopia for everyone. And he was very much at odds with, and even in fistfights with, uh, L. Ron Hubbard, another uh, colleague of his really? time. In the, yeah. Wait, come on. Fistfights with L. Ron Hubbard? So I hear it, it's a common a story. Movie. The Los Angeles Science Fiction Society had at the same time Einlein, Hubbard, Ray Bradbury, and it was a vibrant place. And Crazy Bob at that point was, um, I would say, uh, ideologically polymorphous. What the hell happened? <laughs> Okay, so... Uh, Later on, as happens to so many of us, he got, in his old age, quite conservative and crusty, um, considering that the best form of human government would be the junta. I'm not sure about that one. <laughs> well, when you came along with the, the Mars trilogy, uh, there were a couple things that were unique at the time. One was Mars was not hip then. It's insanely hip now. Uh, and you were writing a pretty leftist economic model onto basically how the geoengineering, the terraforming of Mars would play mm -hmm. out. Is mm -hmm. that an accurate statement? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And uh, in your mind where you're doing that, is that's how you could realistically imagine Mars actually being terraformed, or this was at last a chance, a, a platform to play out some of your leftist fantasies? Well, maybe more the latter. Um, um, when I was writing the Mars books, it was the Viking data. The Viking data came in in 76, and they gave us a Mars that was a million times more detailed than what we had before that, Mariner and Viking. It took a while to assimilate for science fiction writers and yeah. say, well, what have we got here? And then it was Sagan and his crowd that said, if you were interested in terraforming and wanted a planet to do it, Mars is as good as it gets. It'll, it will never find a place that is more close to being terraformable, and they began mm -hmm. to model it. Mm -hmm. So I was the lucky recipient of that. When I began to write novels, and I saw that Mars would be a great place to backpack, and it resembled the High Sierra, which it didn't, but in Green Mars and Blue Mars, it does. Nevada so, it resembles, right? It was, yeah, it goes like from the Ruby Range in Nevada to the Sierra to the Coastal Range uh, over the trilogy. Um, it was uh, something I wanted to do. And then the leftist ideas was just my, my hippie California, um, um, uh, Gary Snyder, New Age, Buddhist, right. um, you well, know, Gary, you know the drill, here I am. <laughs> Gary was a red diaper baby, he grew up with it, did you? No, no, <laughs> I grew up in Orange County to a, a, oh. blue, a blue diaper baby. Um, Whatever, it was a, not a political household. It was a technical and a pseudo apolitical household. Um, pseudo apolitical household is a Well, I, I think that the American technical class would say, happens too often, that, well, uh, I'm just into technical stuff. I transcend politics, or politics is the grubby stuff and science is the clean stuff, and they try to make an artificial distinction between the two. So are you basically turning against that, or did somebody get to you with a more interesting and persuasive frame. It was a combination of Snyder, Frederick Jameson, um, Ursula Le Guin, and Ursula, the science right. fiction community itself. I was very lucky in my teachers. All three of those were teachers of mine at different times in my ah. life. Um, Jameson was my thesis advisor, and he told me to write about Philip K. Dick, the greatest living American writer, at which my <laughs> jaw dropped. <laughs> I had only read Galactic Pot Healer, and I was looking at this professor thinking, you've got to be kidding me. You know, it is. Um, but I went ahead and I read Phil Dick on, on Fred Jameson's behalf, and then um, Gary was teaching poetry at Davis when I was there, and ah, so I took perfect. classes from him. Right. And Ursula came down to UCSD and taught science fiction writing at UCSD, so I'm thinking, just do That's what they tell you. Yeah. Have fun. And you have. That's good to know. 
Uh, questions from the audience. Um, I'm going to start right in the back with the beige arm. <laughs> Go ahead and stand up and, and say your name. That'll help us all if we can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm deep into Aurora right now. I'm deep into reading Aurora right now, and ah. it's maybe you know I've read a couple other books of yours in the past. Um, one of my questions is. You never seek out genetic modification as a solution to the problems that you've created for your books. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Um, this is a biologist. Yeah. <laughs> in, you know, in, until the CRISPR technology came along just last month or so, um, I felt like the solutions need to be imagined at the macro scale of... Um, I, I think that it's all too complicated and we don't know enough yet to propose genetic uh, engineering solutions to most problems. Now, I used to say that also about artificial intelligence, but things have been changing so quickly recently that as painful as it is, I've had to make some reconsiderations. Say a little bit about what you're reconsidering about AI since that is a topic of much discussion and dispute. Well, I think AI is um, that we mistake it for uh, the science fiction dream of it. And I think artificial intelligence is really our way of saying either science or capitalism or some global system beyond our understanding that seems to have taken over history itself. And so I want to uh, propose that when we talk about AI, we're talking about science and we're imagining it as Big Brother or as a um, Hal in 2001 A Space Odyssey who will, um, out of a mistaken good intentions, kill us all. Mm -hmm. But um, in fact, it's always under our control. It's mainly just really fast processing. And until I began to listen to people down at Google talking about quantum computing, mm -hmm. I thought, it's just like a giant um, adding machine, and so what? It's still, history is still in human hands because the machines don't have intention, will, consciousness, etc. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if quantum computing succeeds, which is we don't know because we don't know if we can stabilize the qubits, but if we can stabilize qubits and they begin to, and the algorithms written for them are, are clever enough, we might get some really fast computers and then you ask them, are you conscious? And they're gonna say, I don't know, because I don't know what consciousness is, but let me think about it. And I'm thinking, you know, maybe a trillion times faster than you are, so whatever's going on, let's call it consciousness. And this is the narrator of Aurora, a machine that probably is not conscious like we are, but uh, when the processing speeds get that fast, we are very, the Turing test is a very low bar. We're easily fooled. <laughs> like, our, like your iPhone you're thinking is conscious, you know, just because it answers your question. So the Turing test is not the big test. Here, here. I would say I'll add something on, on quantum computing, which is that in August, one of the seminars about long-term thinking <clears throat> we have coming is from Seth Lloyd. And he's one of the pioneers of, of quantum computing, and his talk is called Quantum Computing Reality in the sense that he's, um, he's been with it long enough. He's got perspective on it and the hype and the anti-hype. Oh, yeah. uh, hopefully he'll be able to lead us into what's actually happening. And when I heard him recently just chatting about it, uh, frankly, more is happening than I thought. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's incremental, and you know, then you get a sense of what's the rate of the incremental improvement and what things happen at various stages. That's what he'll talk about, and then all of us will be trying to keep up with it. Other questions, thoughts? Right here. Speak up, stand up, speak up. My name is Carter Brooks. Oh, sorry. I, uh, I appreciate very much your uh, sort of allusions to the fact that what we have as capitalism right now is sort of no one's fault in a way, that it sort of naturally emerges that way. Um, and so my question is to sort of expand on that a little bit. One of the pet descriptions I use of the situation we're in is that we have a civilizational organism that's metabolizing the stored energy of the planet. So it's like having a big open bank vault. You know, or even earlier before we sort of tapped that, we certainly had big open resources. So, to w so in that context, modern capitalism as we have it, I see as something that sort of naturally emerges out of that situation, not from a sort of nefarious intent or Mm -hmm. etc. And I'm wondering whether you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's a, I, it's very important, uh, I think, to um, read or at least read abstracts describing the work of uh, Giovanni Arrighi, who, who is a historian of capitalism, that it began in Genoa, and, and it's a marshalling of external resources that can be exploited and, and manufactured and sold 
And so it goes through a, a stage of exploration and then of industrialization and then of financialization when it taps out its resources. And he has a history of capitalism going to Genoa, Holland, Britain, USA. And the point at the end is that there's not a next place to expand into. And this is one description of the crisis that we're in now, the environmental crisis, the financial crisis. Are, there's not a next stage to do capitalist growth into, which was always a bit uh, rapacious to local populations and to labor all along. It was extractive, exploitative, and, and um, accumulative in ways that weren't fair to the workers that actually did the work. So it's never been a just system, but it was never been on purpose designed in a villainous way. It's just people protecting their own situation. Now, once we're in this situation, the growth would have to be in terms of improvement or involution. Space won't work. It doesn't pencil out. The gravity well keeps space from working. And there's nothing out there that we don't already have here that we actually need. So, I mean, in the science fiction community, they would say, well, of course, the next stage is the solar system, and the next stage after that is the Milky Way, and blah, blah, blah. No, I always argue against that as being um, physically impossible. So we are in a fix where we need a change. And this is why I think we've got this moment. The, the long now, we also, I hear people talking about the long emergency, although the long emergency, kind of cute, is not as long as the long now. Mm -hmm. The long emergency might be a century or two, where we, in this next century or two, we have to get into a balance with the biosphere as a civilization. That's a kind of an emergency. Good way to put it. Question. Okay, uh, I'm po you're pointing way over there. Hi. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask a bit more about your vision for the, f the future and how technology could play a role in reducing carbon emissions when in a state-controlled system. You, you painted this portrait of, um, you know, the state takes control of the banks and, and then, you know, implements some type of carbon tax and that leads to a benevolent system. But, but we do have a, 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 a current example of a state-controlled economy that's trying very hard to make progress on environmental concerns, which, which is China. And I was an environmental journalist in China for years and saw firsthand how that, those efforts often failed. I mean, state-controlled oil companies like Sinopec and, and PetroChina would refuse to upgrade their refineries even though they were ordered to, and um, state orders to install wind turbines would result in wind turbines in the ground, but they weren't connected to anything. There was just failure after failure of that system. So I just wanted you to explain a little more about how your vision would work. Sure, but now let's, uh, ch let's say China is an aberration and a strange example because they've got a billion people on a, a land surface the size of the United States where a lot of that land is unusable desert like here, and that what they first wanted was poverty reduction uh, in the initial uh, Chinese effort, was first to get themselves out from under the imperialist Western crushing of their culture and then to get onto a quickly industrialized basis. So they went through the kind of Stalinist Maoist moment that was a moment of extreme suffering. And now it's said that 200 engineers run the country. But as you're pointing out, that isn't really possible with a billion people, because orders go down, and then they filter out into the sand, and they disappear. Better example would be Cuba. If you have an XY graph that talks about quality of life and the other uh, factor is impact on the environment. All of the countries go from, well, we don't have much impact on the environment, but we have very poor quality of life. And the graph moves up like that. The more quality of life, the more impact on the environment. And then there's this one aberration that sits out there like a, an amazing factoid, which is Cuba itself. Now, I don't know. If, it, if the whole world immediately went to Cuba's rules, um, we would be better off. I don't know if that's true or not, but I propose it because of the data. Um, let's say if uh, the entire world ran by Denmark's rules, we would be better off. So there you got social democracy rather than some bizarre pressured form of socialism and communism. Social democracy? I think so. So you go, in terms of where we are now in neoliberal capitalism, where capital itself has no brain, except it's just profit, it will eat up the world in the same way that the Chinese did in their attempt to improve their people, maybe even worse. So what you need is anti-austerity, Keynesianism, um, social democracy, and then post-capitalism of some kind of definition. And I'm saying the state is often mythologized on the left, the right, the center, as a big bad beast, and I'm saying let's call the state government, let's say we're in charge of it, and change the terms and see if we get a better feeling about it. 
Who's the next person with a mic? <laughs> hey, um, it kind of related to what you were just saying. Um, you know, we often criticize the revolving door between banks and, and government as it is. How, how do you, when the regulated and the regulators are the same people in a state-controlled banking system, how do you, how do you control corruption? Um, when, you know, how do you get, stop those people from paying themselves? Well, um, it, I guess what you would do is just say that people get a good salary for a good day's work and then take out um, bonuses. Uh, and corruption is a problem, but then what you need is um, the, the general accounting office, the GAO, is a very much more important federal agency than is usually given credit for. Um, we have checks and balances within the federal government system that, when allowed to work, do a, a, an okay job. With, with that said, you know, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. There's, that's a pretty good descriptor of humanity's uh, engagements with itself. So you would have to try to be careful, but I would rather have a government, elected democratic government in control of finance than finance in control of government. And the, the 2008 situation, the, the head of the, the, the ch chief of the Federal Reserve and the Secretary of Treasury and the Assistant Secretary of Treasury were all Goldman Sachs veterans, and they were thinking like a bank. So uh, there's a great book, Thinking Like a State, um, James Scott, Thinking Like a Bank. You know, it's another kind of state that can be uh, mythologized in the same way. And so they, they bailed out the banks rather than the people. So the next bailout, that's why I'm saying nationalization is the next bailout. You bail out the people rather than the banks and see what happens. It will not be the in solution because success is failure. This is one of those troubling phrases of my teacher, Fred Jameson. It's dialectical, which means that you can't understand it, you know. But success is failure. So say you, you get rid of infectious diseases and suddenly the infant mortality rate drops like a stone and suddenly the population rate rises to right now. So you had a success, it turned into a failure or it turned into the next problem, let's say. So when I propose a solution, believe me, all I'm trying to say is let's try these things out and then struggle on from there. Yeah, my version of that is all, all panaceas become poison. Uh, next person with Mike. Stand up, name. Oh, uh, my name is George. I'll you standing so people can see you. Um, I had hoped to return to the IPET formula briefly. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, are, arguably, I'd propose that some of what happens in the E um, say how much uh, appetite or how much consumption is allowed or, or occurs has to do not just with the state of the T technology, but with the kind of futures market on technologies or science fictional understandings of them. Uh -huh. And if, if that's true, I wonder if some of the interests you mentioned at the beginning of your talk might see manipulating that futures market and overselling certain technologies, say car uh, carbon capture and sequestration, CDR, solar radiation management, geoengineering, as a way of unstranding some of their assets. Do you think that's plausible? And if so, how do you think it might play out? Well, if I understand you, I'm thinking that the, what you want in futures markets is to buy options, and, and, and essentially it began as insurance. If things go wrong with this investment by something that happens in the future, can I hedge? So you hedge yourself against bad futures by doing what's resilient or robust. So the idea of the hedge is a strong one until it turns into an excuse for casino gambling. Um, it's John Lanchester that said there's many words in economics that now mean exactly the opposite of what they originally meant. So when you go to a hedge fund now, it means crazy gambling rather than uh, insurance against things going wrong. These things happen. Um, it's also true that if capitalism has, has absolutely tapped out the world as a place to uh, get a maximum rate of return, they dive into your unconscious minds, that's the entertainment industry, but they also dive into the future, so that's debt and mortgage, so that they are attempting to buy the future itself. The system buys the future. So I, I think futures markets is one of those terms that gives me a quiver of, oh my god, how dangerous, like nitroglycerin or what Warren Buffett called, you know, weapons of mass fiscal destruction. Uh, and, but nevertheless, we do have to plan a future, and that, that's one of the tools for it. So I think what you need is fiscally uh, educated people who know about derivatives and futures markets and, and puts and calls and options in general uh, going to work on this as a can we afford the future type problem where you have a very low discount rate on the future and try to build a livable future out of it you know, financially as well as uh, ethically. 
Let me come to the last question, which relates in a way, and <clears throat> you're a futures marketeer in the sense of writing futures. It's true. And um, one, I think we all wonder what's in the near future for you. What are you working on? Uh, what books are coming out? What's, uh, what's next from Stan? Well, I, I have, um, I have uh, given you um, the plot of my next book tonight, as you may have guessed. Um, and the, um, the, th that's Wall Street in the foreground there. So um, uh -huh. uh, you see the setting, a local habitation, and a name for a story that you might call Utopia Against Finance, but it really it's called New York 2140. And the sea level rise is approximately 50 feet, 50 which feet. Mm -hmm. I thought was quite radical until I read the latest paper by James Hansen, <laughs> right, right. at which point it seemed like James Hansen was just trying to make my novel look more plausible than it did before. And it doesn't uh, stop at 50 feet. It, it basically well, it just depends on, it, it certainly doesn't have to stop at 50 mm -hmm. feet. If all the ice on the planet melted, it would be 270 feet. We'd be underwater here, I think. Mm -hmm. We definitely would be. <laughs> so is this a... I forgot where we were. <laughs> is this a tall Venice we're looking at? Yes, I call it the Super Venice. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm saying that if, even if Lower Manhattan goes under, um, between material science and people's stubbornness to stay in you know, the Big Apple, that people will cope and there will be waterproofing and there will be gondolas and, you know, Super Venice. It's a fun novel. Singing gondoliers and stuff, I can't wait. Yes. Um, what's the title of this? It's called New York 2140. Um, I can't wait. Thanks so much. Thank you. And one more thing. You get a special challenge ah. coin, ah. which reminds you to seize the millennium. Aha. Uh -huh. Carpa millennium. There you go. <laughs> you do it like few do. Thank you. Indeed. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you all. Uh, just a last couple of reminders. Uh, we have Borderlands Books, who, as many of you know, is the wonderful Cinderella story of the sci-fi bookstore that was uh, rejuvenated by San Francisco and is here selling uh, all of, well, many of, of uh, Stan's books. So please buy them. He's going to hang out here and sign several of them. Uh, and if you can, help us move the chairs to the wall. Uh, that would be great. Don't try and pick up more than one chair. Just pick up your one chair, move it to the wall. Thank you very much. Thank you.